Our guest on this podcast is the eminent American, what does one call him, political sociologist, sociological uh, political scientist, uh, general wise man, Charles Murray. Good evening, Charles, or good morning, well, as the case may be. Good to talk to you. Uh, in a recent piece of yours, a mere article, I think in the Weekly Standard, you confessed to the social disease of Francophilia. <laughs> and I caught a lot of flack for it. Yes. Did you? Francophilia, in simple translation, love of France. Uh, well, I'm well, rather Francophilic myself, but they're wrong in a lot of things. For example, there are common things, uh, constantly quoted, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more it changes, the more it is the same thing. It is absolutely wrong, at least if you're interested in social history. The perversion would be, plus ça change, plus ça changera. The more it changes, the more it will continue to change. And surely that applies to America, which could be America the Beautiful or might be called America the Changeable. That's a long-winded introduction leading to your basic concern in your recent works, both the monograph just published by AEI titled American Exceptionalism and your book of last year, a very interesting book titled Coming Apart. So you say we're changing. What's the nature of the change? Well, the change that I discussed in Coming Apart is that we have developed classes over the last 50 years that are different in kind uh, from the classes we have had before. It's not just a matter of wealth and poverty. It is a development of a new lower class that no longer participates in the traditional institutions of American life the way it used to, and the development of a new upper class uh, that is increasingly isolated from and even more important, ignorant of a life in mainstream America. When you uh, tune in on the many culture critics or the worried writers about America, uh, they point up certain very significant changes. Uh, the decline in the rate of marriage. Fewer people get married and they marry at later ages. And divorce remains more or less constant, but one half of all newly formed marriages uh, end in divorce. Uh, second, uh, 40 to 45 percent of American births are what we used to call illegitimate, uh, happen out of wedlock. Three, uh, coming to, we are approaching a negative birth to death ratio. The replacement number required is 2.1, as everybody knows. And we seem to be at 2.1, but if you take out Hispanic births in America, we are already below 2.1 and heading downward, just as is all of Western Europe. And then we note as well, as many critics do or observers, renewed class division, which is correlated probably with increased income discrepancy. That's only an overall summary of some of the main changes that worry observers. They all worry you as well, don't they? Yes, they do. Uh, and so the ones about marriage uh, worry me uh, as much as any others because so many other consequences cascade uh, from the reduction in marriage. I would just add a couple of caveats or codicils or whatever to the picture that you just uh, painted. Uh, the first is that um, it looks a whole lot different if you disaggregate these trends by class. And, you know, you lump them all together and, and it looks like the country is sliding downhill at a uniform rate. In fact, the upper middle class has been holding a line on marriage and childbirth, uh, remarkably well. And some other important, uh, some other important behaviors as well. The, the decline is concentrated in the working class. And that's new. The second caveat, uh, is, has to do with income. You know, I'm willing to believe that income, increased income in disparity has some role to play, but I don't think it's, it's a primary role. I think there has been a change in values, changes in the culture uh, that uh, are, are more important. We can talk about those. Well, problems. some other trends that are commonly observed is a decline in religiosity, though the general uh, cliché, a view is America is the most religious of all Western nations. If so, they're becoming less so by whatever measures you want to use, including even church attendance and increased dependence upon governmental assistance and an increased yielding to the notion that the government is our protector, is our friendly uncle. 
or has a maternal role to all the rest of us. Uh, that surely as well is part of the total picture. And you deal with all of that, of course. Uh, and you deal with it wonderfully well, this new uh, class separation or the consequences of it, by um, uh, characterizing two uh, communities. They're sort of ideal type in the sociological sense. Uh, they are Belmont, Massachusetts, and Fishtown, Pennsylvania. Actually, both of those really exist, Belmont in Massachusetts, and Fishtown is, I believe, a uh, neighborhood in Philadelphia. That's right. It's, uh, it's a working class neighborhood that has been a white working class neighborhood probably since the revolution in the same site. Uh, and these are totally different ways of life uh, lived, uh, carried forward in Belmont and in Fishtown. Let's talk right. about that. Let's talk about who their occupants are. I define the, I, call, I use Belmont as the label for the upper middle class. And, and no, let me specify that the upper middle class is very different from what I will call the new upper class. The new upper class is a much smaller group. By upper middle class, I mean uh, people with a college education and working in the professions or in a managerial job. That's how you get into Belmont, by having those uh, credentials. Fishtown is a working class community defined by people who have no more than a high school diploma and who are working in blue collar jobs or low level service jobs. So I, I, I take the census data or the uh, current population survey or a variety of other databases, I categorize people into Belmont or Fishtown or a third category which is neither and I analyze the statistics, and I just simply summarize them by referring to this is what happens to Belmont, this is what happens to Fishtown. Well, most of the so-called measures of social pathology, which I've already reviewed, which those observing American society and change are worried about, the high illegitimacy rate, the low marriage rate, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they occur in Fishtown but not in Belmont. They have been increasing. The the uh, statistic that I I find most startling, uh, just as a change over time, has to do with marriage. If you go back to 1960, let's not just look at Belmont as a whole and Fishtown as a whole. Let's limit it further. Let's look at just non-Hispanic whites, because that puts aside a whole variety of complications introduced uh, by ethnicity. Gee, apparently that leaves out Mr. Zimmerman. It. It does indeed. And I also limit it to people ages 30 to 49. And the reason for doing that is, in 1960, as in 2013, 30 to 49 is pretty much the prime of life. Uh, okay, so that's the population I'm talking about. In 1960, 94% of Belmont is married, which is as close to a universal as you get in sociology. Uh, meanwhile, 84% of the people in Fishtown are married. Extremely high. Mm -hmm. There's a difference, but it's still the overwhelming norm. You, you fast forward to 2010 when my numbers stopped, and you're down to 48% married in Fishtown, from 84 to 48%. Meanwhile, up in Belmont, uh, you've still got 84% married, and almost all of that decline from 94 to 84% occurred before the mid-1980s. Since then, it's been pretty steady. And still further, you have divorce declining in Belmont. So you have a marriage alive and well in upper middle class white America and just going to the floor in white working class America. There are yet some other social measures of great import. One is criminality, particularly as indexed by being sent to prison. And clearly there's a difference between Belmont and Fishtown in regard to that. Yeah, almost everybody who goes to prison is from Fishtown. Yeah. It is, it is a remarkably concentrated statistic. And in the book, I go through that, uh, uh, the arguments about why this might be misleading. You know, is it that upper middle class people commit a whole lot of crimes and they got good lawyers so they get off, or a variety of other artifacts. And the fact is that crime is overwhelmingly comes out, always has come out, of working class neighborhoods. The difference is that there's a whole lot more of it now. This is a case of something, Milt, that the upper middle class doesn't even notice crime anymore. You know, the crime rate's been going down. It's it's out of the headlines. It's not a political issue. Well, crime in in Fishtown is still on the order of four to five times what it was in 1960. In 1960 in Fishtown, in the real Fishtown, in the literal Fishtown in Philadelphia, people left their doors unlocked. 
Um, kids played in the street with no worries about whether they were going to get in trouble or anybody was going to bother them. All that has changed dramatically in working class America. So the more it changes, the more it continues to change. But uh, what is so far not represented in our uh, conversation, and which of course we must turn to instantly, is uh, the simple and basic question, why or how? How has this come to be the case? Well, uh, when it comes to the formation of the new lower class and why it is that you have men dropping out of the workforce and marriage declining and the rest, I stand by my analysis in a book called Losing Ground that was published back in 1984. I think that the expansion of the welfare state has a lot to answer for. It fundamentally changed the rules by which social life was played in low-income communities. And it changed those rules in directions which made it a lot easier to do things if you were a young person that looked really attractive in the short term, like commit crimes or, or have a baby even though you didn't have a husband, and in the long term are incredibly problematic. However, Bill, there is not a word about that, uh, virtually not a word about that in the entire book. And the reason for that is very simple. I think at this point, no matter what caused it in the first place, there is not a way that we can turn the spigot off or turn it backwards by a few changes in laws. By this time, you have profound cultural changes that have occurred in, uh, in the American working class. And the fix is going to have to be cultural, too. I do go into more detail about the causes of uh, the development of the new upper class. Those are drawn largely from the bell curve, where... Um, a book that uh, Dick Ernstein sure. published in 1994. And which got you, you a fair amount of... Some of your listeners don't, yes. <laughs> got you a fair amount of criticism and controversy. Uh, at the time, it was quite a topic of conversation. Because yeah. it pointed well, to, it, it, it dealt basically with the difference between whites and blacks with regard to attainment. Well, no, I, I want to correct you on that. It had a chapter that dealt with yeah. that, and that's what got all the attention. To be sure. But, but the dynamics that focus, the book focused on its subtitle was The Role of Intelligence in Class Structure in American Life, um, uh, the, is that over the course of the 20th century, brains became worth a whole lot more in the marketplace, and we got a lot more efficient at sending uh, talented young people to good colleges, no matter what their social background You know, one of the pleasures of doing this sort of interview is that occasionally you can indulge your own memories. Forgive me, but maybe this will be of some interest to you. Uh, I've got a son who is now well-established and working well in certainly a middle-class profession and is uh, no longer in his teens. Uh, but in, when he graduated from high school, he went to Northwestern University here in the Chicago area. And after two years, he dropped out and drove, a, said it didn't really interest him and he didn't like it. And he started driving cabs in Chicago, which was sort of an exciting life. Uh, about two years after he started that, he called me one night and said, Pop, you remember you said to me when I quit uh, Northwestern that you can live by your brains or by your by your mind. I said, yes. He said, well, I've discovered mind is better. I, I want to go back to college. <laughs> and he went back to college and uh, hit Phi Beta Kappa, which was easier and easier to do because of grade inflation, to be sure. But uh, th that's that's the difference you're talking about, living by your muscles or by your brains. Yeah, and, and, and brains, which uh, were all, have always been helpful, became really, really valuable in the 20th century and are still very valuable. Because today. of the jobs so, that developed and exactly what they required. Right. And, and also, and also the, the, the simple gigantism that, that occurred. I mean, an attorney today uh, can make millions of dollars or charge four figures per hour if that attorney is so smart that he or she can figure out uh, how to, these incredibly complex multinational mergers, or if they can figure out how to navigate the incredibly complex regulatory labyrinth uh, in Washington. They, they are worth that much money because uh, being able to do those things can make a difference in the bottom lines of corporations of hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, Charles, you've, you, you've argued essentially in the book, uh, the, the major book, of last year, and it also shows up in your monograph just recently published, uh, titled American Exceptionalism, An Experiment in History. You've made the point that the new working class, uh, and you even sometimes call it the new lower class, has uh, taken a different turn from the kind of um, 
industriousness and uh, seriousness and commitment to traditional values which once characterized the American class, but now they've turned essentially to dependency upon a welfare state. Lord Beveridge, so many years ago in England, uh, right after the war, issued the great Beveridge report in which he said the ultimate goal of government should be to, quote, provide security from the cradle to the grave. And in essence, that's what the welfare states of Western Europe and increasingly under the current administration of uh, the United States uh, seem to aspire to do. And you think that develops bad habits and bad attitudes and reduces industriousness, reduces uh, serious familial orientation, etc. cetera. Uh, a counter to what you've been saying, and some have provided that counter, Timothy Noah uh, won in a recent review in the New Republic uh, of your of your book of last year. That counter is simply, well, yes, but uh, the jobs are no longer there. Uh, the uh, turn towards uh, essentially a world economy has taken many jobs out of this country, and they've been taken elsewhere to reduce the labor rate costs, but also uh, jobs available in this country are increasingly being taken by people who will work for less, especially Hispanic immigrants. And uh, it isn't easy to go on being an employed and sort of um, uh, uh, obedient working class person, obedient that is to a, a critique and to a culture which once sustained the working class. One further element or measure of that is the decline in religiosity. So it can be argued. The economy, uh, the world economy and globalization uh, has re re rewarded many, including many in your new uh, uh, middle class or your new uh, superior class, uh, and has certainly disadvantaged the American working class. Well, let, let's, let's then look at, at history and see if we can come up with a natural experiment. Uh, let's, let's suppose that the American economy uh, suddenly starts to boom and that jobs uh, become readily available, and not jobs at the minimum wage, but where you have a median uh, hourly income for these jobs of about $18 an hour, and that the jobs are so plentiful that there are help-wanted signs all over town and this is not for people with high educations, it's that these are low-skill jobs. Well, we had that ideal situation during the last half of the 1990s. Uh, all, of the, all of the characterizations I gave of that, including the median wage, are all accurate. And uh, what happened to male labor force participation during those years? The answer is if you believe that globalization is the problem and lack of jobs is the problem is, oh, the guys must have flocked back into the labor force. Of course they flocked back in the labor force because they were only out of the labor force because they couldn't get uh, jobs at a decent uh, rate of pay. Well, it didn't happen. <laughs> the only thing that happened was that the dropout from the uh, labor force that had been increasing steadily uh, through good times and bad since the 1970s leveled off somewhat. It didn't actually uh, uh, continue to increase as much as it did before. It didn't drop a smidge. And, and during the subsequent pretty good years of uh, the early to mid-2000s, it continued to rise again. What I'm saying, Mel, is that if you believe that the reason guys are not in the labor force anymore is because they just can't get those jobs, it is first contradicted by that kind of evidence, and it's also contradicted by another kind of evidence. If you go to any working class neighborhood and just talk to people about why uh, men aren't working, you do not get stories from the people in those neighborhoods saying, gee, Joe, just looked for work for months and he couldn't find any, he's sort of given up. What you hear is, that guy doesn't want a job. He won't work even if jobs are available. This is a problem that employers talked about during the recession and nobody believed them that even though the unemployment rate was so high, they couldn't get people who would show up every day and uh, do a full day's work. George W. Reality, Bush, uh, speaking in favor of liberal resolution of the problem of uh, the presence of illegal immigrants, you remember, would say more than, did say more than once, uh, well, but they are actually a boon for us because they will take the jobs that Americans don't want to do. Uh, yeah. What did he have in mind? Something like what you're talking about now? Yes, and and what frustrates me is that 
this reality which is very well known on the street throughout the United States seems completely invisible to the Timothy, Timothy Noahs of the world uh-huh. and, to, and to academic economists. Um, it is not well hidden. You don't have to pry it out. All you have to go down do is go down and sit in a working class bar and get in conversations with people and this is what you're going to hear. Uh, I should pick up on one interesting concept you've got and uh, we should go see where that leads us with regard to explaining the difference between the new upper middle class and the new working class. And that term that you use is cognitive homogamy. Um, that yeah. means essentially differences in intelligence. Yes, and, and likes marrying like. Of course. Um, the, you know, there is, IQ is a very uh, controversial su- subject, but there are a few things that there just is no scientific doubt about. One is it predicts all kinds of outcomes of success in life pretty well. Not perfectly, but pretty well. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, that it's passed down through generations. Whether by nurture or nature doesn't make a lot of difference, but you have a strong correlation between parental IQ and child IQ. Well, what's changed over the last 50, 60 years is that you increasingly have people at the very top of the IQ distribution marrying each other. And a lot of that's because of the uh, success in getting talent to college, no matter where it comes from. And another part of it is the, the feminist revolution, whereby women flocked into the labor force. So you take somebody who graduated from Harvard in 1950, let's say that this person had an IQ of 135, who did he marry? He probably married a society girl of the country club whose IQ was not nearly that high. Who does he marry today? He marries uh, the uh, lawyer sitting across the table from him during litigation who graduated from Yale Law School. And that's happening on a very large scale, and it's further increasing the advantage of the new upper class because they aren't just handing down money to their kids. They're handing down talent. What has happened in the culture, the popular culture, to sustain uh, the attitudes, which are essentially attitudes of dependence and, in some ways, attitudes of uh, non-participation on the part of lots of working-class males? What has happened in the culture to sustain those new attitudes, or, in fact, even to encourage them? You know, I don't know if it's a popular culture that does it. I think a lot of it is the local culture. Look, consider, the, consider this classic case. Uh, in, in 1960, I'm old enough to remember this, and you are too, I think, Milt. In a high school, there might be one girl who got pregnant. She was not necessarily the object of derision or teasing, although I suppose sometimes she was. We had one such girl in my senior class. So she, she was treated pretty sympathetically, but boy, was she an oddball. Boy, did she stand out. Mm-hmm. Boy, did she understand that everybody considered that what she'd done was pretty dicey, you know. Well, suppose you don't have one young woman who's pregnant in high school. Suppose you have 20 or 30. And suppose that their babies are brought to a, a, a nursery in the daycare yes. center in the school. Now, is that, by the way, uh, is that true uh, equally for white high school students as it is for black high school students? I can't, I can't answer that directly. I can say that high schools throughout the country uh, try to accommodate. It's, it's taken as the only fair and right thing to do, to accommodate uh, their students who have babies. But we do know that we have uh, out-of-wedlock births running from 75 to 80 percent in black America and running to about 35 to 40 percent in white America. Ah, but here you go with the class difference again. If you look uh-huh. at children of the upper middle class, you're still looking at single digits in terms of the percentage. That would be true of wedlock. black members of the upper middle class as well, of course. Uh, to a lesser extent. If you look at the white working class, you are, uh, you are in excess of 50% of white births in the working class uh, being to uh, women who qualify for Fishtown. And it's a, so you're already at the levels that black uh, out-of-wedlock births were but, you know, when I'm interested in what cultural models and change in cultural models may do to change the way people live, here's one simple item. Uh, if you're a Hollywood female star or starlet and you're having babies, you're also having them uh, just as often out of wedlock as in wedlock. Uh, yeah, and they're very visible. And that is celebrated rather than uh, rather than uh, viewed with 
some con- condescension or some abusement. It's viewed rather as the way to do it. Uh, that's that's correct. However, I'm, I'm just saying, you know what, I think that those standards changed within working class neighborhoods uh, quite a while ago. And Maybe they're leading Hollywood, are they? By the way, I, I, think that, I think what happens is, look, um, babies are cute and adorable and uh, sex is fun and you don't the, the question is not to explain why children are being born out of wedlock the question to explain is why did it happen so very very seldom in advanced societies throughout history uh, until now so what is the import of all of this for our immediate and our mid-range future uh, it I'm afraid may, it makes it much easier for us to look very much like Europe. Uh, we haven't talked much about the new upper class, but our new upper class in many ways is more and more resembling the European elites. Uh, it used to be that America's people who ran the country in the United States so it sort of felt very strongly that they were supposed to be one of the guys. They weren't supposed to get too big for their britches. That, that uh, they were just, you know, supposed to, they were supposed to be Americans first and not to claim that they were part of the upper class. That's really changing. Meanwhile, the lower class just looks very much like the dependent class in Europe. And the the line of least resistance uh, politically uh, seems to be that we simply go uh, become indistinguishable from an advanced uh, European social democrat. That, uh, that then would state. predict, would it not, ultimately to the bankruptcy of, government, of our government, just as... Uh, European governments, all the way from Greece well, to just, Spain, are going backwards. You, yeah, you just uh, cited one of the bits of uh, reasons for hope, and that is that we are going to get to watch what happens to Europe yeah. before we get there. And it's possible that that will be a cautionary tale. Uh, it is possible that we will look more closely at Sweden, for example, which has changed its policies very significantly away from the, from, from uh, the kind of welfare state it had before. And Germany has made some of those moves in the same direction. It's conceivable that as we look at Europe, uh, we will be able to yell halt and and uh, and turn it around. That's that's one of the few reasons for problems. As we close, uh, a footnote or a sidebar on the new uh, upper middle class, uh, namely their political preferences. The fact is that though they've profited tremendously from how the economy has changed, and though they marry one another and the intelligence of their kids and their, the admission of their kids into uh, preferred colleges uh, all increase, as all of that is happening, uh, they um, don't see any potential looming catastrophe. Indeed, they, are, they also favor the welfare state, though they don't collect from the welfare state, and they vote at least the large sectors of the people of that class uh, on the East Coast and the West Coast, they vote Democratic. They sustain the, uh, are going in the direction that you think is ultimately ruinous. It's, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting story here, Mel, because if we, now, now we're not talking about the, uh, the upper middle class, we're talking about the new upper class. And these are the people who are in prominent positions in their local cities or in nationally prominent positions. And you can say, say where they live, by using information on zip codes. Yeah. So I uh, collected information on zip codes on education and income and all of the zip codes in the country, and I ranked them all from top to bottom. And if you take the top 5% of those, which I call super zips, it's very interesting. Overall, they're about equally balanced between uh, Democratic and Republican zip codes, but there is a huge difference in their location. Uh, the the blue zip codes, the ones that vote overwhelmingly Democratic of among the super zips, are around Washington D.C., around New York City, around Los Angeles, California, and around the San Francisco Silicon Valley area. Well, that just also so happens to be the four centers at which the people with national influence on our culture, economy, and politics live. And so you go to Dallas, Texas, or Houston, Texas, or Chicago, Illinois, or or Kansas City. The people who live in the in the most elite zip codes there very likely to vote Republican. But uh, in the centers where the, make, the movers and 
shakers are, they're overwhelming. I wish we had more time. I truly do. Uh, but let's make very clear that all of these thoughts, of course, and these findings are far more fully elaborated in two recently published uh, volumes. Uh, Charles Murray's book of last year, Coming Apart, The State of White America, 1960 to 2010, and that's published by Crown Forum, and just recently issued as a monograph <coughs> directly from the American Enterprise Institute, of which, of course, Charles uh, has been a fellow for many years. Uh, that is titled American Exceptionalism, an Experiment in History. Charles Murray, it's always a great boon to talk with you. Thank you so much.